What we're going to do is summarize some research we have done that looks at the impact of state policies during the COVID era on health and economic outcomes. And we're going to uh, have the, these are what we've laid out as, as the, the, the learning objectives for today. We're going to get into thinking about different dimensions of policy responses that mainly we're looking at the state level, but we can also imagine at the more local county level. And we're gonna talk about the real-time data sources, the national, local, real-time data sources that we're using to look at these outcomes, because that's been, you know, that's characterized our work of the last year is looking for what are the data streams that we can measure these things by really quickly. We're gonna then also talk about the methods, especially trying to say when we're evaluating state impacts, state policy impacts, we wanna get at causal, causal effects. And so there's going to be methods challenges here. And we're going to also just assess these real-time data sources and going forward, what kind of res data resources we should be looking for or keeping an eye on as we think about longer run impacts of what was what happened during the, the last year, as well as the ongoing policies that are affecting our recovery out of the, the pandemic. So just to give a, a sense of the, 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 the completed paper so far during the last year on the COVID era that we're going to summarize from, you know, many of them are about tracking what went on really quickly. So some of our first papers will describe or we're using like the only sources of data we knew available in March about March, for example. And you'll see many of these are, are also, you know, many, many of our papers here are, uh, see, uh, are, are lead authored by um, Professor Sumeda Gupta, who is at IUPY, Economics Department, Health Economist, many papers here also, Anna Bento, who is an epidemiologist in the School of Public Health in Bloomington. So this is the work of a large group of, of, of individuals that are across both campuses, and we are really excited about further collaboration. So any of these things we're talking about, they're really ongoing projects we would like to have more, more, more interaction around. So some of the themes that have come out from our completed papers so far. The first was that the, the first question we tackled was how much of what we were seeing happening in the spring of last year was a causal impact from different decisions states were making as opposed to a very large national response to news and information. And so that was, that was our first finding from various sources of data that we'll, we'll go into a little bit more, but our, our very first one was using simply Google search trends data. That was the only thing we could find in mid-March about mid-March. And that is, uh, what, these are one of the ways we've been looking at these real-time sources. So for looking at job market data, the current population surveys, one we were turning to. We'll spend a lot of time talking about mobility data from cell, cell device tracking, because that ends up being an important feature of the kinds of things we think we can look at immediately. And then we'll also talk about, you know, right now, for example, the quarterly workforce indicators and the other um, QCEW, there are Census Bureau census data sets on all workers that are now becoming available. So QCEW now has quarter two of 2020 included in what's available. So that's gonna give us really fine-grained data to, to, to look at later. But you know, the current population survey, for example, it's about 50,000 households. You know, so these are very limited size as opposed to QWI being the entire US workforce microdata coming in there. Um, so, so we'll also particularly talk about health data that we are using nationwide electronic health records from uh, like, in, in the current year, 41 million patients. We, we think there's, and these, these all, the, these ones, they're free data resources. We have to go through a registration process and a, there are, of course, data privacy trainings we have to you know, all adhere to, but these are available for, for anyone right now to be using 
Symphony is a particularly valuable data source also because it is micro level data on every prescription in the US. We get them with access about three days after it's been completed. So there's a lot we think we can do from, from these sources. So we're gonna talk about a little bit of the theory or the, you know, what should we have in mind as we look at these kinds of, uh, of, of questions of what the impacts of state policies are. How do we go about getting this data? What should we think about as the pros and cons of some of these new raw data sources that we really haven't used before? And then we're gonna go into several examples where we'll go through, here's how we took the data and what, what results we have. So first on, on tracking public policies, because there's just such a large variety of types of policies we really hadn't seen before. So these were first thinking about physical interaction, minimizing policies. You know, we could in theory be having interact, like we could be using taxes, we could be using all sorts of you know, mandates, but we know that what happened was using emergency declarations, then that allowed a lot of other type, you know, types of restrictions that we all are very familiar with. That was either information, there was encouragement, and then there was actual regulation of reducing physical interaction. But there's also these most indirect strategies, which are, you know, we can't make you, even if we don't say you have to stay at home, we can close the type of venues you can go to. So we minimize that by closing businesses or we try and close places. So these are, these are the, the types of strategies we, uh, we look at. And then of, of course, ones that are much more directly aimed at transmission that, you know, in each of these, we can think about what are the potential unintended consequences on economic activities like business closures is a very obvious one, loss of jobs, right? So in addition to reducing transmission, we're trying to balance what can we do that doesn't harm society in other ways. Something like a mask mandate we put in this, in this you know, um, realm of policies as there isn't much you can talk about as a downside. It's not causing those kind of economic losses, right? Whereas it's directly thinking about transmission. We're also going to, in, uh, in, in very new work we're doing, thinking about quantifying state vaccine policies and using them to look at outcomes. So that's where we will end with this data we're, we've been collecting. So first, just a quick look at what, how do we characterize what states did when in the early closure period? So starting in, you know, we can, we're, what we're plotting here is here, here's for each state, we count up what fraction of the population each state represents. And then we say, the population lives in states that account for what percent of the US total population by when had they experienced these events. So almost no one was in a state that had experienced any cases as of January, but then by, as of the early January, but soon we were getting to 20% and 30% and so on. So that's the first thing that was happening. And then we look at in the green, what about states adoption of emergency declarations? That all happened pretty quickly. We went from none of the population to everybody in a period of about, you know, close to two weeks or so there. Then states started putting in gathering restrictions. In yellow are the school closures. The school closures also just happened all so rapidly. Within a period of like a week, three days really, it was between a Friday and a Monday, and the majority of school districts closed. So it also gives us a sense of where would we have variation? Some of these things, we just don't have enough variation. It happened all at the same time to be able to talk about effects. You can see the red, the stay at home policies, there was more variation in when those were adopted. Right? So here's another way to look at this and also of the reopening. So we can, we create you know, graphics like this just to explain how much, you know, where was each state at in what they decided to do? And can we look at right before and right after these states compared to other states to look at the impact of these policies? 
So what we are doing in, in new work is taking this same strategy to quantify what's happening in vaccine rollouts. So this is um, work we're, we're not yet, um, we're just starting to put together, which is trying to do that same kind of work for vaccine rollout policies. A little more on that too. So now on to thinking of what are the measures we have. First, you know, of course we are interested primarily in thinking about what are the main policy aims of these, you know, all these interact, all these things that were put into place, the aim was minimize cases, minimize deaths from COVID. So um, those, the, the sources of data nationally by day by county, there are many, and they're almost identical. So if we think about CDC has an aggregate data set, New York Times has one, Johns Hopkins has one, USA Facts, they're all um, contacting state health departments and county health departments and getting the data in daily, but it's very aggregate. There isn't any demographic information really in that aggregate collection that's, that's nationwide like this. The only nationwide source that has race and ethnicity and other demographics, age, gender, is the CDC surveillance data. It's restricted, restricted access to get county level identifiers along with demographics, but there are public use versions that are state level, again, by day, by week, and so on. But there's, there, there's some issues with missing data there. So one of the papers we have is comparing between these data sources to understand what's the extent of missingness in the CDC surveillance data. So, but, you know, when, when thinking about these cases and deaths, we know cases especially, like unlike the study that, that near you led, it was not being collected in a random way that we get a sense of what the population prevalence is. So, and deaths, we know there's a lot of, you know, early on, especially deaths that were COVID that were not being recorded as COVID. So we, we wanna talk now about intermediate endpoint data that we think, you know, for, for policy evaluation, it's very important to look at, did the policy have an impact on how people behaved and then be able to then say, okay, and then what was the impact on cases and deaths? So mobility, cell phone data, has become in this area really important, valuable tool. It's also useful because it helps us measure the economic costs of the epidemic and the unintended costs of the policies. So looking at where did people stop going and where were the jobs lost and so on. Uh, and, and, and there are others, you know, other data sets, we want to be able to measure where jobs were lost and very important for health research, of course, is looking at non-COVID healthcare disruptions, and then for all of us looking at these longer term outcomes, what do we say about what social impacts are, what's happening with mental health consequences and changes within healthcare institutions. So here is, now we're gonna go into some specific examples and I'm gonna turn it over to Cody now to walk us through examples. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, so um, as Gosley just said, um, you know, we're now just going to show you a series of almost case studies of uh, examples of studies that have used different kinds of data uh, and to look at different aspects of the of the epidemic and the policy response to it. So one of the first sort of collections of research that we focused on was trying to understand the effects of different social distancing policies. <laughs> Um, on uh, patterns of physical mobility. And we used, um, we used data from several different uh, vendors, but, but all of them are sort of uh, uh, measures of physical mobility based on um, data that's harvested from apps that are on people's cell phones and smart devices. So 
in a sense, you can think of these as measures of like where your cell phone has been and sort of tallied up uh, and, and measured as like counts for particular geographic areas uh, or measures of uh, uh, how many how many devices have visited particular places of interest, okay? A feature of these data is that you, you can measure them at, at very high frequency. And, uh, and that allows you early in the epidemic to look at things, uh, look at the effects of social distancing policies or changes in information that the population might have had uh, really quickly. And ordinarily that's sort of, you know, not such a big deal, right? We don't usually care about the five day effect or the two week effect of a particular policy. But um, early in the epidemic, we certainly did, right? That we wanted, there, there was this idea that if you could just reduce um, uh, physical interaction, you might disrupt transmission and sort of bring, bring some control to the epidemic. Um, so that high frequency data, that was key. Trying to combine that with, with relatively precise timing or, or well-measured data on when policy interventions went into place in different locations. Um, that was our, our basic strategy in this line of work. Um, so this is just one example that the, the sort of full project here uses a lot of different cell phone based um, outcome measures, specific concepts of mobility. This one was popular initially. Uh, this is a measure of uh, how many hours uh, your device spends in the home location in the place where you you know you spend most of your time or at least most of your time in the evenings and so on okay and um the first thing to look at is is sort of if you take these data and and aggregate them to the state level and plot out a time series a daily time series you can see in this picture that the, these the sort of light gray lines in the graph are showing you individual states the thicker blue line is the cross state average smoothed a little bit, okay? And the gray lines turn red when the state adopts a stay at home order or uh, sometimes it's called a shelter in place order. And a, and a first thing to just notice is that, you know, these were controversial laws, but uh, a lot of the, and there was, a, there was a very large increase in time spent at home. So that's, that's one measure of like people practicing social distancing during the early part of the epidemic, but that most of the growth in time spent at home had already happened by the time states adopted stay at home orders. Um, and so this is gonna suggest like, if you go and do a more careful econometric analysis to try to separate out time trends uh, from, specific policies, you're likely going to find that these stay in home orders didn't have a huge effect on people's mobility. They could have had some effect and they could have kept mobility down longer um, than it would have stayed by itself, certainly possible. Uh, but, the, but the sort of dramatic increase in time spent at home largely predated most of these policies. To try to separate things, we use an event study framework, right? So to dig a little bit deeper into this. And this method, you know, this is you know, not probably not the place to put a bunch of equations up on the board, but but uh, this general approach is uh, pretty much the workhorse research design and statistical modeling strategy for this whole literature. So there are a lot of studies uh, looking at how different social distancing policies uh, affected various outcome measures, and a lot of them use some form of this. And what's happening in these in these kinds of research designs is that we're trying to isolate changes in the outcome variable, changes in time spent at home in a state um, that is uh, attributable to uh, the early or later adoption of a particular policy in that state. So uh, normally you don't look at it, uh, you don't look at it in this form. What you do is fit the model and, uh, and then plot the event study coefficients uh, and look at them visually. So what you see in these pictures is event studies, separate event studies conducted uh, to look at a sequence of policy moves. So there's emergency declarations, school closures, stay at home policies. And we also did the sort of earliest uh, COVID death in the state. What you're looking at here in the sort of negative space on the X-axis is, is time until the event happens in that state. So in the 
first panel, you're looking at days until a particular state is going to uh, announce an emergency declaration. And what we hope for this research design to work, what we hope is that those sort of pre-event coefficients, pre-event trends are basically equal to zero so that there's no difference between states that are about to adopt this policy and states that have already adopted it or are never going to adopt it uh, in the lead up to the policy change. But then afterwards, uh, perhaps there, there becomes a divergence between the two states. So you can see here, the early events like emergency declarations, we find the largest effect of those kinds of policies, much smaller sort of estimated causal effects of stay at home orders and school closures and those sorts of things. And I think that's partly because the emergency declarations sort of conveyed a bunch of information about the seriousness of the situation to the population and gave a certain amount of advice, but also because they, those early events probably capture the downstream effect of the sort of sequence of policies to come. So you can think of them as sort of a, a total effect. One thing you can do with event study estimates is use them to, to sort of project out what actually occurred and compare it to what would have happened in the absence of these kinds of policy changes. So this graph shows you that the orange line in the graph uh, and the blue line in the graph are the things to, to sort of focus on. The blue line is showing you um, um, how much uh, time at home people would have spent according to our, our event study regressions if none of the states had adopted emergency declarations in the first place. None of that effect had materialized, okay? The orange line in contrast is showing you what actually happened, okay? So the, the implication here is that, is that, you know, there wasn't much of an effect early on, but as these things started to, to come into play, there is a substantial divergence between time spent at home in the real world and time spent at home in this counterfactual scenario where there are none of these policies in place. Um, but a lot of the effect would have happened anyway. Okay, so we find about in this particular break, I don't wanna take these numbers too seriously, but we find the state policies in this sense explain about 55% of the overall increase in time spent at home with the other 45% something that would have happened as people just voluntarily did this or responded to the sort of public health threat. So a second, a second line of work um, that I looked at that's kind of different is, is now trying to focus on measuring uh, the prevalence of uh, active uh, uh, COVID infections. Um, and this is like, you know, difficult to actually measure. So, so NIR has done some great work uh, using randomized sample surveys to measure this. Um, but using, using sort of clinical testing data, it's really hard to measure prevalence accurately because only a tiny fraction of the population is tested each week. And a lot of that testing uh, is, is biased towards people who are symptomatic or are known to have been uh, in contact with someone. So they probably provide an overestimate, like the fraction of positive tests probably provides an overestimate of the actual fraction of the population that's um, infected. Um, and so, you know, there, there's sort of a need, I think, for some methods to try to, and data to try to uh, improve on that kind of measure, especially if you'd like to track uh, active infections in sort of uh, near real time. So what we did in this project is we, we built a new data set that links uh, hospital records with uh, COVID test uh, data from the state of Indiana. And, uh, and then we try to identify or estimate uh, prevalence under alternative assumptions. We use assumptions which are weak enough that most people probably believe them, uh, but they're not strong enough to deliver a point estimate in most cases. So what they do is produce an upper and lower bound on true prevalence. The rough idea that we're, we're focused on here is that uh, there are some subpopulations that are tested at much higher rates than the general population. And in particular, people who are admitted to the hospital for any condition, even conditions that have nothing to do with their COVID risk, are tested at much higher rates. Um, so people that are you know, involved in a car accident or have a heart attack or a stroke or are delivering a baby, they're all tested at much higher rates. They're not necessarily selected on COVID risk though. And we should be able to sort of uh, gain some leverage from that kind of observation. So we focus on two or three kinds of assumptions here. One is that 
something called test monotonicity. So this is an assumption that people who are tested don't have lower prevalence, lower risk of infection. That's pretty innocuous. A second is non-COVID hospitalization monotonicity. This is the idea that people who are hospitalized for a non-COVID health condition, and we do a bunch of specific kinds of non-COVID health conditions, uh, that they, they don't have lower risk of infection than the general population, right? If anything, higher. Uh, and then finally, the strongest one we try is just that uh, the non-COVID hospitalized population has the same risk, has the same risk of infection as the general population. After, and in all these cases, we adjust for age, uh, but otherwise keep it the same. So very quickly, uh, here you, this, this graph just shows you testing rates. This is what we're trying to exploit. So in the population, you get the bottom line. This is the fraction of the population in Indiana tested each week. It's extremely low. Uh, but if you look at the hospital population in the red line and the black line, you see that a much larger share of that population is tested in each week. Uh, and of course, at the, at the very top, people who are hospitalized for something that is an influenza or a COVID-like illness, they're, they're tested at really high rates. But of course, they're, they, they would be a bad group to focus on for estimating overall prevalence. So this graph shows you what our upper and lower bounds look like. Uh, under different assumptions uh, each week. So the blue, the blue region gives you the upper and lower bounds uh, when you just assume test monotonicity. That's the weakest assumption. The red region, um, that shows you prevalence using both the test monotonicity assumption and hospital independence assumption. So that tightens up the bound quite a lot. Um, so the idea here is just that you could use data like this in virtually any state, uh, and you'd, you'd, provide, you'd have a way of uh, adding to a state dashboard a, a sort of a fairly tight uh, interval on what true prevalence is likely to be. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and turn it back over to Kosli. I didn't use, use up too much time. Oh, sorry, and I was just putting the answer, the, the last question was uh, that on, on effects on mental health, uh, on child mental health, that's gonna be- we're, it's Coming up, yeah. That is coming um, up, that's- when we will mention. So let's see, I think I, I know which I'm at the third example yep. is on healthcare use. So, whoop, I'm sorry, went to the slide here. Um, one thing we, we have been doing with this large electronic health records database called Health Jump, which we get access to through this initiative called the COVID-19 Research Database, which is run out of DataVant, which I know Reagan Streif has many, many interactions with and, and um, works on all of the infrastructure that went into providing this kind of data access to, to researchers broadly. But we are able to look at what's happened in canceled care and then longitudinally follow the patients to look at what the consequences might be of that canceled care. Now we know that there is selection in you know, who decides to cancel is not a random occurrence, but there are some things we can look at in the electronic health records data, timestamps of various things that help us get what's as close as we could get to experiment, like randomness in you got canceled and you didn't sort of ways of looking at then the consequences later on. So first of all, of course we know there was a lot, a big drop in use of healthcare that occurred right away as the pandemic hit. So these are records um, just looking at January first week of 2019. You can see that the database was getting larger and then there's this, this drop here. So we, are, we want to try and use the part of this drop that was as random as possible in order to be able to draw lessons about what lack of care does to health outcomes. This gives us this, this opportunity to, to do that in addition to, of course, documenting what happened. So these are these broader questions, which of the health, so because there's, a lot of concern about trying to identify which is high value care, which is low value care. We think this might give us this opportunity to look at, oh, you, you know, for these types of services that got canceled, 
maybe we don't see as much of a consequence as we do for these other types of healthcare, uh, healthcare uses. So that's what we are trying to, to do here. So the COVID-19 research database is a set of healthcare data providers that have come together through this data for good uh, program. And there's just a, a really large scale set of things we're getting real time access to there. We're only gonna talk about two of those. There's probably about 15 different data streams coming in. So Health Jump is this very standardized set of electronic health records that come in from different providers. Um, so it could be you know, all of the major electronic health record platforms, but it's coming in because this is a company that manages the apps of the, so the, the data transfer between the systems and the apps. So it's standardized for that reason, but it is all payer. So there's uncompensated care, source of payment is on there too, expected source of payment. And we have from, the, we have from earlier, but we're using a, a, the stable population sort of from 2019, January onwards. And we do not get emergency visits in here for institutional reasons, this does not get captured here, but all other types of healthcare are there. And it has uh, the timestamp of when the visit was scheduled, like when was it that it got into the system that somebody called it in and set it up. And we're gonna use that as a way to disentangle who are the people who canceled because of the pandemic versus didn't make the visit in the first place, didn't, didn't schedule the visit in the first place post pandemic. So just to give a sense of how the data flow into Health Jump, the electronic health records exist. And then there's the, you know, once, once all these things come in, we've got the missed appointments and procedures here that go into the appointments, labs and procedures, and all of the codes come in this way. So there's, there's a lot of detail we could use about the timing of when each thing occurred. So we're going to look at people who had scheduled appointments before, no, had scheduled them during this time period. And we're gonna look at people who scheduled in February and are you know, less likely to have been canceled because they took they, they already had the visit before the pandemic set up, but then the same people who scheduled at the same time in February for March who got, who got um, canceled because of pandemic related closure, you know, changes. So we will try compare between them and we'll look at the covariates, we'll look at the observable characteristics of these and say, are you essentially identical except one of you, you know, you called in at the same time, but one of you got scheduled a little bit earlier than another, and then that meant the difference in whether you you actually went in for your visit. So we, um, you know, just to give a sense of what the lag time is between when a visit gets called in and when the actual visit gets. So if I call in today for a, 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 you know, for, for different specialties, I expect to have a different amount of lag because there's just usually, you know, some differences in about how long it'll take me to get a visit with a cardiologist versus a pediatric specialist. So these are just some looks at what that distribution is like. So what we want to say is, you know, it's, it's really not that different by month. It is different by specialty. But we should be able to treat, you know, we, we should have expected about the same type of call distribution coming in in March, if not for the pandemic. This is all now pre, pre pandemic. Um, when we look at by month the cancellations, we see that there is this difference that occurs right after the pandemic and scheduled and, vi and, and missed visits. So that tells us, you know, we are going to have some variation there that we can use to identify our effects. So there's not much of a change in the number of scheduled visits because they were scheduled before the epidemic risk was fully understood, but there is a large increase of the cancellation rates that occurred. When we look at this by other types, 
of care. So we're, we're also seeing this in oncology and radiation therapy, as well as in cardiology. We've looked at it through all of those, um, those, those kinds of characteristics. And then we go and see, you know, what was the cancellation rate in March 2020 compared to there's always a natural rate of cancellation happening in 2019 as well. And we pick out, you know, for some there was not. So these two yellow ones we've highlighted are the ones where the specialties where we saw the highest rate difference compared to like in, in 2019 in colorectal surgery. And then the lowest was in neurology and neurology. And then all the others are, are somewhere in between. So we you know, want to look at these, um, how many of the visits were made up. So we look at if you were a person who canceled, you know, did you then end up having a follow up, another visit of the same specialty re rescheduled? So we, we see that yes, there was this uh, catch up happening where if you were subject to a larger probability of cancellation, you do then schedule the next one sooner because you are trying to do this catch up. So we see evidence of that in these data. And then we are now, you know, now going to look at the actual health outcomes because there is part of this project has now merged in mortality data. That is, even if they, uh, the death records that are coming in through social security are getting merged in with these data so that we can look at whether these individuals, you know, that as a health outcome. There are other things we're trying to sort through the lab test results. We're trying to, it's just a lot of those and we're trying to identify which are things where this indicates the lab test where health has been getting worse versus, you know, significantly. So that's what the, that's there. I also want to mention that we are, you know, this is all payer data, but we have at, at IU, access to Optum, which is coming in from commercial plans as well as Medicare Advantage. So there's a large a set of data through Optum. It's about 6 million Medicare Advantage patients in 2020 that we can study very, uh, almost, you know, not as real time because with claims data, there's going to be a six month lag usually to be able to think that claim has been closed. With, with the health jump data, we're able to get just a few days later the data, but with Optum, we've got, we wanna talk about, you know, we have this data source and it's thanks to many institutions at IU, including with Reagan Street. So we've all got access through and, and, and people who can help with mediating access. We have, there's a website through which anybody with an IU affiliation can, log in and get access and, and go through the training. And I want to also mention that this is a very good resource to be using for these, these, um, these, these topics. So we're planning something similar, although we won't be able to use, of course, the time of when the, the schedule was, when the visit scheduled, but, but wanna just um, talk about the, the data sources here. So Optum comes in from different places, but are all claims related. And this is the kind of sample sizes we have across the years that we have the, the Optum data set from 2007 to now we have it through end of September 2020. And by July, we will have data through end of March 2021. So we will always get this update going on and we have the university license for the next five years. So please, if, um, you know, as if, anyone is interested in finding out more, please let us know. We'd love to. I'm going to hand it over, I think, back to, oh, um, I'm, I'm going to quickly go over the job market results as well, and, and then hand it back to Cody. So we looked at many things related to the unintended consequences of these, of these policies of social distancing one of which of course is loss of jobs. So we've used the current population surveys, which are the most representative, most real time looks at national and state job markets we can get. And we have many ways to, to look at, are you in an occupation that has 
a lot of face-to-face -face interaction and look at differential impacts that way. We've also used these data to look at racial and ethnic disparities in impacts on jobs and economic consequences here. And um, we, you know, I'm just gonna zoom through these, these slides. This is, these are the, the disparities we've, we've identified as compared to previous recessions. So demographic groups that have suffered more in this recession compared to earlier recessions. And we've um, looked at, you know, we can look at by family status. We, in new work, we are looking at how school closures down to the local level, school closures have affected maternal employment. We can look at that in a very fine grained way, actually now, starting now because these, the census data sets that identify, you know, for everybody down to the county are, are starting to come out just like weeks ago. So we have not yet got any results through, but we'll be, we'll be looking at, um, you know, so we find that the extent of exposure to face-to-face -to -face interaction in your occupation industry mattered in um, how you were affected. So now I'm going to turn it back to Cody for child mental health. Outcomes. Um, all right, so I'm gonna try and go through this um, last bit quickly so that we don't eat up all our time for conversation. There's some good comments in the chat um, already. So uh, some new work, the last two examples we're gonna give are, are um, you know, totally incomplete work uh, that we've just sort of started. Um, so the first one that I'm excited about uh, is, is trying to understand how the move to sort of mass uh, remote schooling um, or the sort of reduction in in-person schooling um, affects the sort of flow of new diagnoses and treatments of health conditions among children. So um, the, the sort of broad idea here is just that um, the, the overall healthcare system, especially for certain health conditions, uh, likely encompasses more than just the medical care system itself. So it's more than just doctors and hospitals and nurses. Um, and so for certain health conditions, you, you could probably tell a good story that just says elementary and high schools uh, play an important role in sort of monitoring for or identifying and, and probably inducing the eventual diagnosis and treatment of a variety of childhood health conditions. And our thought is that uh, if you shift the local school system so that it's primarily providing educational services using remote instruction methods, rather than in-person schooling, um, that the flow of new diagnoses for a bunch of these health conditions is gonna slow down in that area. And we'd like to try and measure and see whether that happened, whether there were fewer diagnoses happening in places uh, that, that um, had less in-person schooling and whether that changes rapidly once schools begin to reopen. Um, and then down the road, we want to understand, like, what are the consequences of, of delayed diagnosis for some of these health conditions? So assuming it actually happens that there are fewer ADHD diagnoses, for example, uh, or fewer, um, I don't know, uh, hearing impairments, uh, notice, uh, you know, does it matter that we just, we just identified it a year later? Uh, what, are we, what should we expect from that? So that's sort of what we want to look at. It's tricky because there's not yet, it's, it's a big mess schools, right? So building we have a variety of efforts in place to try to build data sets on school level, uh, school district level policy decisions, which have varied over time. Um, but those are, those are slow to tidy up properly. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll come together eventually. But one thing that looks surprisingly effective is to use the SafeGraph cell phone mobility data uh, and identify the addresses of uh, elementary and high schools. So there are some external data sets that make that possible. And then measure the volume of in-person cell phone visits to elementary and high schools day by day since, since the start of the epidemic. And uh, that'll be a measure, you know, if, if in-person visits are much lower than usual, that's a, an indicator that you're doing a lot of remote schooling, not as much in-person schooling. As it bounces back in some places, you're going to see that that's measuring the return to, to sort of uh, in-person instruction. 
So we want to construct measures like that using cell phone data, then do some record linkage and combine that, that information to the Optum uh, health insurance database that Coastly was talking about and use that to try and study how, the, how there's a connection or whether there is a connection uh, between new, new diagnoses as measured by claims um, uh, with the sort of local uh, uh, schooling activity. So, so far we've, we've, we've got a good start on step one and we're working on step two. Um, step one, I think is, is very interesting. So this is purely descriptive. We're just measuring, using SafeGraph to try and measure school, in-person schooling activity. Uh, and these graphs just are descriptive. They just show you what's happening in different parts of the country. So if you look at the states uh, in the Pacific census region, you can see at the beginning of the epidemic, there's a big crash in the, the number of cell phone visits, average number of cell phone visits um, to schools. Okay, that's the, that's the shutdown. And a thing that's obvious in, the, in, in this collection of states is that there's, there's still basically no recovery. Okay, it's, they've, they've been closed the entire time or, or very, very um, restricted in their in-person schooling. That is not true everywhere in the country. Um, so uh, in the Northeast, it's also pretty low, although there's a bit of a reopening that happens in the fall in some states. Um, uh, if you look at the mountain region, there's close to, in some states, close to a full recovery, full reopening, not quite. Uh, and in other states, it's a little bit lower, but there's a lot of differences across states. Some have reopened much more. I think people know this, of course, they know that some places are open and some are not, but this provides a pretty nice measure of, of how open, what it means to be reopened, whether, whether not whether the school is officially allowing people to return, but whether they're actually showing up, actually participating. You can see that in some states they are and others they're not. Uh, the Midwest as well. Uh, has had a lot of states that did a sort of partial reopening um, and other states that it's more muted. So we're excited to try to map this data to, to claims data to look at the, the way this has affected uh, new diagnosis and then down the road, how it affects child health downstream. So I'm gonna give it over to Coastly to sort of do our final two second example and then we can, we can have a conversation hopefully. Are you there, Cosley? I was on mute, sorry. Oh, sorry. And I think I'm at, sorry, uh, the vaccine, vaccine research. So what we are doing is um, trying to figure out how to quantify the policies that are used in vaccine rollout. So one thing we have been doing with a large number of research assistants is tracking for each state and having a citation for when this happens, each of the kinds of categories. So these are only one, the first set. Then we have all of the different age categories as well. For each of the state, when is it that eligibility changed? So that's one way of us trying to create what's a, you know exogenously why is it that some people, like a, a 50 year old in California might in a certain county might have gotten vaccinated at a different date than a 50 year old in another, you know, in, in Indiana, in, a, in, in Monroe County, because of the way that the rollout worked. So we want to try and capture all this detail now itself, because we think later on we'll be looking at health impacts. And even though we don't currently have the data that has everybody's vaccination status and date, you know, we. Eventually, if these data sets become available, we'll be ready to put that into us. So we've done a little bit that is looking at CDC data, which we have uh, just scraped from the CDC website. That means, you know, they, there's always the current view on CDC's website of the, the, the COVID vaccine tracker across all the states. We've gone in and just used the Wayback Machine to look at snapshots on past weeks and collected that. And so we've thought about you know, using these models to predict what if the vaccines had not rolled out versus what actually happened with the vaccine rollout. So that's our current work is to try and measure cases and deaths averted due to the vaccine rollout. So I think that's, that's all um, we've got. We'd love to go into Q&A.
Thanks for all the chat comments. Well, thank you, Dr. Simon, Dr. Wynn, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we are open for discussion. You can, um, I see that there's a lot of things on the chat that have been answered already, some questions. If you have, if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question as well. Hi, Dr. Simon, this is Lava Timsina from IU. Uh, so I was wondering, when, when you presented about the instrumental variable method, I was wondering, uh, I mean, they are, if you have a big data set, uh, if you're looking into a lot of data, you would definitely find some of those instruments that can be used as instrument in your instrumental variable method. But did you, uh, what were the different approaches that you used to, for the specification test to test whether your instruments are truly instruments. Yeah, so there's a lot of assumptions that'll go into you know, so, um, I'm gonna actually hand it over to Cody to answer this, but. Um, oh. So we're at early stages yet, but essentially the two, the two big things that I'm concerned about in an instrumental variable study uh, are first, what's called the independence assumption, which mm -hmm. says that you know, people who have, in our case, the instrument is you had a scheduled appointment in March versus you had a scheduled appointment in February and we throw away all the entire rest of the data set. So fixate on that comparison. A cohort of people who were supposed to have a cardiology appointment in February and another cohort, they were supposed to have a cardiology appointment in March. Both groups pre-arranged their appointment like a month in advance. Okay, think of that, that's the framework and the instrument is March versus February. The first assumption is that, like if we were being really pure about this, we'd be randomly assigning people to have March versus February appointments. So the first thing you wanna do is check for balance. We wanna see whether the composition of patients in terms of their prior health, their age, their gender composition, their race, ethnicity, their geographical location, whether those things are about the same in the March cohort, pre-scheduled March cohort versus the pre-scheduled February cohort. So we do a bunch of work there to just look for balance. Uh, and that mostly looks like it works very well. Yeah. Okay, so the, you know, and the, the storyline here makes sense too, that people make their appointments not, they, they don't know COVID is happening yet. So it's, it's unlikely that there's much of an effect. And you could see that a little bit in the graphs that we showed, although it was pretty, pretty rushed. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what's called the exclusion restriction. And that says the only reason that being in the March group would affect your downstream health is because you, you canceled care. You were more likely to cancel care than the February group, okay? Mm -hmm. This is largely untestable. Our story is that the main threat to validity is the COVID epidemic itself. And our story is that both the February group and the March group basically lived through the same epidemiological conditions. They're offset by a very short amount of time. And we could measure six month outcomes or one year outcomes downstream from the appointment date uh, without much differential COVID risk. Um, so that's, that's basically the, the strategy. The other big assumption is whether there's a first stage. And so that you could see in our preliminary work, a very strong first stage, meaning you know, the, the likelihood that you experience a canceled event is considerably higher uh, in the March cohort than the February cohort. So those are the three, those are the three things that I would focus on. Um, but I, I, I don't think it comes down to something as, as basic, like simple as just a statistical test. It's this overall story that we're, that we're pushing. Also early, early stages. So I don't, I don't want to get too far. I don't know. But. Yeah, I'd love to be, if it did get published, I, I would love to read that paper. <laughs> I would love to write that paper and have you read it. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we will be waiting for it. Yes. So I think we are about time. Um, I want to again, thank you both of you for this very wonderful presentation. Lots of insights, lots of new ideas and new data uh, and evidence for, for us to chat and, and open up with as Dr. Simon mentioned in the beginning, collaborations between the groups. Um, if you're interested in some of the components that you wanna 
probably uh, touch base directly if we find the one of them or Dr. Simon or Dr. Wing. Um, I'm going to tell you, I'll be doing that soon <laughs> for some of the things, but, uh, but, but I think I just wanted to really, we really appreciate it, all your, you coming here today and sharing all your work with, uh, with all of us. Thank you so much. And have a good Thank day. Thank you so everyone. much for having us. Thanks to yeah, all thank those you. comments too. And for sure, reach out if you're interested in things. And in particular, since we have a medical crowd here, if you have ideas about what newly diagnosed childhood health conditions that might be school, in-person schooling sensitive, for sure, send me or Kosley an email and, and tell us what we should be looking for. Uh, that would be super helpful. I'll be reaching out to you on that, uh, uh, Cody. Uh, we have a group of uh, uh, pediatricians who are working on some of the research and our conversations came along with some of the things you mentioned. So we're reaching out to you. Good, thank you. Thank you. Bye.